Hello. Hi. Hi there. Nice to see you. It's really nice to see you. Thank you for um for chatting with me today. My pleasure. Happy to do it. I um could you please turn off that fan? Thank you. We make it louder. I just wanted to start by just saying thank you for never lying to us. Thank you for always giving it to us straight. I know that you have saved, I mean, countless lives in your leadership and your honesty, and we are really sincerely grateful. Thank you. That's very nice of you. Thank you. So um, we are here today to talk about going back to school because that's the week that we're in, the time that we're in, and we're doing with a lot of nerves. And I kind of want to jump in because I know I've, you're busy. <laughs> you're, you're kind of important. Um, so um, can we just review just the basics? What should we be doing to keep our families right now safe and healthy? Well, there's the safe and healthy outside of the school system, which you want to get into in a moment, and then there's within this system of the school. You know, there are, there are about five fundamental public health principles that really, no matter where you are, you need to practice them, because I think if we did that uniformly throughout the country, we would not be in the situation we're in right now. We have a very high baseline of infections. You know, you look at the numbers, we are averaging between 35 and 45,000 infections a day. Things like universal wearing of masks in a reasonable way, and I'll get back to that in a second. The other is physical distancing, six feet or more. The other is avoiding crowds, namely congregations, particularly prefer outdoors versus indoors. And anything you can do, particularly now that we're still in the summer season, and then washing your hands as often as you possibly can. That seems rather simplistic, but if you look at the data of what happens when states, cities, and counties do that, it's very clear that they can turn around the surging of infections that we're seeing in several states, uh, including California, you know, including Florida, Texas, and places like that. The thing with regard to school is a little more complicated because it really relates to the fact that we live, as you well know, in a very large heterogeneous country that has a lot of differences and, and variations in climate, in people, in geography, and things like that. But the other thing that varies is the level of infection in any given region, state, city, or county. So we divide it up into green zones, yellow zones, and red zones. If you live in a green zone, it's reasonably easy to get your children back to school. And I'm talking, you know, K through 12. Reasonably easy to get them back, provided the system is able to handle what to do if a child or a couple of children get infected. You have to have a process and a system to identify them, isolate them, make sure they're taken care of. Mm -hmm. If you live in a yellow zone, in which you have a modest degree of infection, you almost certainly have to do some modifications when you bring the children back to school. And that may mean a hybrid of virtual together with in-person physical spacing of the desks, alternating morning versus afternoon, one day versus the other. You just be creative within the context of where you are. The third is really problematic. And that is if you live in a red zone where the level of infection is so high, invariably, you're going to have clusters of infection when children congregate in school, mm -hmm. even though you try very hard to avoid it, it almost was going to be in, in, inevitable. And in those cases, I think you have to think very seriously of whether or not it's prudent to bring the children back to school. I always say, the best way to get your children back to school is as a community, do everything you can if you're in a red zone to convert your zone to a yellow zone and then convert it to a green zone. So rather than trying to force children back to school in a red zone, why don't you try and get wherever you live, whatever county, whatever town you live, get that to be a yellow or a green zone. That's a little bit of a longer answer than I wanted to give you, but I wanted to get every aspect of it. And if you're in a green zone, masks, yes? For oh, kids? yes. 
Yes. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Are face shields as effective for kids as masks? You know, the answer is it depends on the face shield. If it's one where you put it along the head and you have underneath is open, then things that are aerosolized can get under and in. Unusual, but it's possible. It's unlike a mask, which is essentially semi-sealed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so face shields are not as effective as a mask. Okay, that's good. That's good to know. Um, and then as far as like kids going back to, you know, we've all been relying on out, outdoors so much. And in California, you know, the smoke clears up, then we can continue to be outside. But what about what is safe for kids to do sports wise outside? Is it safe for them to play tennis, to play golf, to swim, to play soccer, to play football? What, do you, what are you thinking? Again, I'm, I, I don't want to give you a waffle answer <laughs> to what to waffle on you, but it's complicated. And the reason mm -hmm. it's complicated is that whenever and after we're through finishing talking and you got to go back and figure these things out on your own, think in terms of the fundamental matrix of yellow versus green okay. versus red. So if again, if you're in a green zone, kids can play with each other, assume that they're not infected. If you're in a zone where you have a degree of infection that is somewhat troublesome in the sense of risk, then pick things that aren't necessarily personal type of a contact. And there are sports where you can do that. Tennis is one of them. You know, kids don't play golf that much, but golf is another. Football isn't. Football and and sports like that are really kind of He's frozen. <laughs> You're more important. Hang on just a second. Just give us a minute. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 so getting back to what children can do, that, that if you could to the extent possible, and I know I had three young kids two years ago, and it's very difficult to keep them separated from each other. But mm -hmm. if you want to have organized activities, try as best as you can to do things in which they're not falling all over each other, where they can have the social contact without necessarily breathing all over each other. And if they're playing tennis and they're on opposite sides of the court, do they need to have a mask on? No. Okay. No. All right. And, and is it okay to touch to the tennis ball? Is the tennis ball going to infect them? <laughs> okay, I'm just, ha I mean, what are you, what, are, what is the latest? We know we were all wiping down groceries. Are yeah. we still wiping down groceries? Okay, so that's a great question. Um, and I want to get back to masks too in a second. It's a really good question. And the reason is, is that we used to think that because the virus was detectable on inanimate objects, which we call fomites, that there may be a considerable degree of transmissibility. We're finding out that that's not the case. It isn't that there's zero transmissibility with a tennis ball or a racket, but the overwhelming evidence is that it's much more person to person. Now, getting back to your question that you asked about wearing a mask if you're on an opposite side of a net playing tennis, we need to be practical and reasonable with masks because sometimes the wearing of the masks gets so wearing on people they get tired of it that they might wear it sometimes inappropriately carefully for example if you're jogging and there isn't anybody within a hundred feet of you i mean i live in washington dc and i go down in the evening or on a weekend with my wife and we walk a jog along the CNO Canal. Sometimes you look, you don't see somebody for 200 feet. There's no reason to have the mask over your face. What I usually do is I pull it down and I enjoy the fresh air. When I pass someone or come into closer contact, I pull the mask up. And it's really simple to do. That's so helpful to know, because I think we are all wondering when you're outside, and it's a beautiful day and you don't see anyone, you know, that you're that you're coming in contact with. Do can you just breathe for a minute? Well, yes. well what I do, in fact, this evening I am gonna go out for a rock. So I'll walk out of the house like this, say hello to a few people, 
once I get on the trail and there's nobody there, I just do this. It's the same thing. And then if I happen to reach a point where there are a bunch of people, just go and put it right back up. It's very simple. Now, I think what people do, they overdo it. Yes. And, and they wear themselves out, as it were. That's the point. So if you have like a, a, a kid who's very anxious, because I think this has brought up a lot of anxieties for a lot of kids who would prefer to still be in the tightest, most controlled quarantine, can we assure them that being outside without masks, you know, with proper distancing, inside with masks, with plenty of ventilation and space, is that, will they be safe? Or should we truly be avoiding anyone at all costs? Again, that's a great, question and the answer is sometimes the perfect is the enemy of the good yes where you try to be absolutely pristine careful and you create such a psychologically bad situation you don't want to be careless i mean the idea of saying there's nobody around open the windows let's get some fresh air we can be together or we go outside that's fine to almost hermitize a child you can traumatize them by trying to make them essentially be a hermit. You've really got to be practical, careful, but practical. Yes, absolutely. So thinking about, um, okay, we did that. Okay, da, 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 da. asymptomatic spread, since, we are, since we're in this zone, would you tell us just because other people don't feel sick, it doesn't mean that they're not spreading it to others? You know, we've seen this in the news so many times, especially in rural areas. They haven't had huge outbreaks, getting as much media attention as major cities, but it's showing up. Is there a way to prevent asymptomatic spread? Well, well let me give you the facts first, and then I'll, I'll, I'll directly answer your question. So about 40 to 45% of all of the people who are infected don't have any symptoms at all. So that's almost half of yeah. the millions of people who are infected have no symptoms. Number two, and importantly, about 50% of all the transmissions occur from an asymptomatic person to an uninfected person. So asymptomatic spread is critical, which is the reason why we make the recommendation of universal wearing of masks. Because if you don't know that you are infected and you don't know somebody else is infected, you protect each other by wearing a mask. That's the same. Okay. Okay. I know that you, you, I'm one of three girls, and I know that you have a daughter who's a teacher. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, she's concerned. We love our teachers. We want to keep them safe. What are some words of wisdom you might have for the teachers and educators out there? Yeah, again, it gets back to what I said. It depends on where you are teaching. Mm -hmm. If you are teaching in a zone that has a low level, then easily something only like wearing a mask and being just practically cautious without being reckless is fine. To give you the specific example, you bring up my daughter. My daughter is a school teacher, third grade in New Orleans. And New Orleans, as you know, has a considerable amount of infection. So what they're doing is they're planning. First of all, they started the school year right in the middle of the summer and they did it virtually. Now they're going to in-person. They're wearing masks, they're separating the desks, they're alternating the schedules. They're doing more than just saying we're okay. If they were in a green zone, they would say, fine, wear a mask and forget about it. You're in good shape. Okay, great. Well, best of luck to her. I'm sure she'll be great. I have a third grader and they're, they're okay, you know, at keeping their hands off each other, but. So um, the kids who do have more trouble with this are, um, you know, on either end of the spectrum, the preschoolers. So there are lots of different ideas about how, you know, what's it like for young kids? Are they too young to have a viral load? Are they, you know, do they, is it different for them? And then on the other side of the spectrum, the college kids, um, you know, colleges obviously are now seeing high numbers of infection. What should parents do if they're worried about their college student who might be around infected students or sick themselves? Do they bring their students to home? Do they have them stay there? And so I kind of asked you a bunch right there in one, so I'll let you answer. Okay, good. Well, I, I, I remember them all. Yes. <laughs> okay, so the issue about children and infection has been unfortunately confusing because of a couple of things. An unclear medical literature 
and people making statements that are absolutely incorrect. So first of all, children absolutely can get infected. So the idea that children don't get infected is not true. What is true is that children, when they do get infected, there's a much less likely to have a serious outcome, namely less likely to be hospitalized, less likely to get seriously ill. Is the chance zero? Absolutely not, because we see that some children do get seriously ill, but at a much, much lower rate than adults. Point number one. Point number two, do children carry the virus? The answer is in a study from South Korea, children from 10 to 19 transmitted the virus to adults as easily as adults transmitted to adults. The study said that children who are younger from zero to 10 didn't really transmit it that well. Yet, there was a conflicting study that showed that very young children have a very high viral load in their nasopharynx. And since they have a very high viral load, you can make the reasonable assumption that they can transmit the virus. So even though we don't know everything we need to know about children and transmission, we need to assume that A, they're vulnerable, and B, they can transmit. Now, college. College is a different situation because some colleges are doing all virtual. And I know because I've con they've consulted with me about how mm -hmm. they want to do it. Other colleges are doing something that I think is workable. They're bringing their students in. And as you know, almost all colleges and university have students from all over the country coming mm -hmm. in. They test all of them before they allow them into the campus and on the dorm. If they're negative, great. If they're positive, they isolate them until they turn negative. Once they get everybody negative, they do surveillance testing maybe every other day, a couple of times a week, whatever. Now, the critical issue is the last question you asked. What you absolutely have to have is you have to have the capability when a student at a university with dormitories and common living, when they get infected, you have to have the capability of isolating them away from the other students. Namely, you get a floor of the dormitory or some colleges are devoting an entire dormitory mm -hmm. to keep people there for the 12 days, 10 days or whatever it is wow. that they need to be isolated. The final thing is the one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to send them home because when you send them home, you're going to be seeding the community from which they came and you're gonna use the college campus as kind of a super spreader event. And you don't wanna do that. That's a lot of super spreading. Yeah, it really is. I mean, throughout the country, you could do that. And colleges where they're having trouble just talking kids into actually complying and wearing masks. I don't know how many college kids are paying attention to me right now, but can, you just, can we just give them a, hey, college kids, if you wanna stay in school, please wear a mask. You know, Ms. Garner, I have been pleading through TV and, and radio for months now. And I, and I really uh, feel a little bit uneasy because I've never been a preachy type person. Yeah. I don't like to be preaching. I don't like to be pejorative in essentially making people feel guilty. So what I say to the young people is that even though you're perceiving correctly that the chances are that if you get infected, you're not gonna get seriously ill statistically alone, even though don't be too confident because we're now seeing that people from 18 to 34 are having an increased incidence of hospitalization of late. But putting that aside, when you get infected as a young person and you assume correctly that you're not gonna get seriously ill, the natural response, which is innocent and you know not doing anything evil or bad, you say, I'm not hurting anybody. I get infected, I'm in a vacuum, so what? That's very much incorrect because you're not in a vacuum. The fact that you've allowed yourself to get infected means you are inadvertently and innocently propagating the outbreak. And when you propagate the outbreak, it doesn't stay with you because it is likely that you will infect someone else 
who will infect someone else. And then all of a sudden, someone gets infected who is vulnerable. Someone's father and mother who has cancer chemotherapy, a woman who's getting irradiation for breast cancer, a child with immunodeficiency. So even though you think you live in a vacuum, you have two types of responsibility. One is an individual responsibility to yourself. And the other is something that you have to accept. As a member of society, you have a societal responsibility. You don't want to be part of the problem. You want to be part of the solution. So that's what I try to get that point to young people. I know it's inconvenient. I know you're saying, this is my first or second or third year in college. I don't want to waste it being clamped in. We understand that. You can have a reasonably good time by some fundamental, simple precautions. Don't let caution to the wind, because you're not only going to be hurting yourself, you're going to be propagating a bad thing, which is a pandemic. I, I'm going to try to find a way to get that to college students, that message. It's so important. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Let's talk vaccines. There's um, obviously there's a, we just want to know, you know, especially given that a, that a study that a vaccine had to be given up on pretty late in the game. Um, how are they tested? How do we know that they're safe and effective? You said we may see a vaccine um, as, as soon as November, but once we do, how long will it take to distribute to those families who may not be high risk? Okay. All great questions. We'll, <laughs> we'll tackle them one after the other. Okay. So there are uh, seven candidate vaccines that will be tested in the United States. Other countries are doing a good job of vaccine development themselves. Three of those candidates are in phase three clinical trial. Phase three clinical trial means you're testing it on tens of thousands of people, usually around 30,000 per trial. The phase three started in the end of July. We project that in at least three of them, and then the fourth one will be a month later, the fifth and sixth one will be two months later, but let's take the three that are really advanced. It is likely that we will get an answer as to whether or not they're safe and effective by November or December. And I think that that's the most likely. Is it possible that we'll get an answer before then, let's say October? It's conceivable but unlikely. So let's assume that November, December comes and we have a couple of vaccines that actually have been shown to be safe and effective. Even now, before we know they're safe and effective, the companies are making millions and millions of doses so that by the time we get to the end of this calendar year and go into the beginning of 2021, there will be millions of doses at the end of the year tens of millions of doses in the beginning of 2021. And by the time we get to the middle of 2021, there likely will be a couple of hundred million doses, which means that people who need the vaccine will be able to get it. Now, when you start off and you don't have a hundreds of millions, you just have a few million, who gets it first? There's a committee from the National Academy of Medicine that literally yesterday came out with the recommendations of what the priority is. And the priority should be frontline workers and healthcare workers who are putting themselves in danger first. Then there are people who have underlying conditions who if they do get infected, they have a problem. Then they have essential members of society. And then the fourth group is everybody else. Now, finally, you ask the question of how do we know it's safe? You know, it's very interesting, something happened yesterday that I think underscores that the system is working. And that is in one of those trials, a, a volunteer developed what's called a severe or serious adverse event. We call it an SAR, serious adverse event. What happened is that triggered a pause in the study so that no more people temporarily will get enrolled in the protocol until they figure out what's going on and they add extra precautions to watch out for that happening again. So the very fact that one of the trials got paused is not necessarily bad news 
in some respect, it's saying that the system works. Our monitoring system for adverse events picked up an adverse event and said, time out, we're going to hold off until we can figure this out. So when that day comes that, you know, your average Joe is actually able to become vaccinated or to get a vaccine, we can trust that the system has worked and that we will be safe receiving that vaccine. The, the answer is yes, because there are multiple checkpoints and multiple points that essentially are, are you know, what you would call not necessarily fail safe, but they're, 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 they're benchmarks that you get to. So the group that looks at the data to make a recommendation is an independent group called the Data and Safety Monitoring Board. Data, because they look at the data, see if it works, and safety to see if there's any problems with safety. Monitoring, they monitor the trial intermittently at predetermined points they look at the data and they're the only ones that are allowed to look at the data. If they see there's a problem, they say, stop, no good. If they see things are going well, they say, keep going, keep the test going. If it looks so good, they may say, hey, you want to stop now and approve this because it really is such a good vaccine. That has nothing to do with the company. It's an independent group of people. So given the fact that you have these outside independent groups, you can have a fair degree of confidence that if there's a vaccine that's safe and effective, it's going to be proven to be and not guess that it's going to be. So given that we're going, that first frontline workers, of course, thank, thank God for them, healthcare workers, people with underlying conditions. So just say, um, the average Joe, when do you think those hundreds of millions of vaccines will start to be trickled down to, um, you know, the rest of America? Probably by the mid to end of 2021. Okay. Like I said, by the end of this current calendar year, there'll be a few million, 10 million or so doses. Once you get into the first quarter, you're talking tens and tens of millions. Once you get to the second half, of 2021, I think that fourth or last group will be able to get vaccinated. Okay. And speaking of vaccines, um, I am a, I'm a big believer in flu shot. Um, flu season is coming up. Can you just talk about the, the flu shot? Do we have our kids get it? Is there too much going on? I mean, if they're wearing masks anyway, does it matter? And Okay, for, for kids, how much are their immune systems getting screwed up by not having the kind of the friction of the everyday germs that they're used to being kind of knocked over the head with day to day? Well, I'll, I'll answer Sorry, the last... I, I mean, there, I, I'm, not, I'm not taking your time lightly. I'm going to make you talk. <laughs> no, no, no. I, 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 let me answer your last question first. Okay. First, that's a good question. No, having children cut off from the normal types of germs that come in their immune system is pretty well developed anyway. You're not going to sideswipe it by doing that. So put that aside. That's actually really great to know. We, I think yeah. a lot of moms that I've talked to, we've been like, what's going to happen? Is everyone, are we all going to get every stomach bug under the world is in the world as soon as we take off our mask? Okay. So that's the first. Well, if you get a newborn and you sequester them in a germ-free environment, that's different than having mm -hmm. a five-year-old who you tell them to wear a mask. It's very different. Okay. So the second part, is important. And that is, what about flu shots? You really should get a flu shot. So everybody six months of age or older should get a flu shot. Even with the flu shot, we are hoping that the kind of public health activities that we do, mask, physical separation, avoid crowds, which you're trying to avoid getting coronavirus infection, will also prevent you from getting flu. And we have some indication because in Australia, which is in the Southern Hemisphere, and their winter is April to September. Mm -hmm. So just this past spring and summer, they were in the middle of their winter and they had the lightest flu season in memory in Australia. Wow. And we think it's because everybody was wearing a mask Mm -hmm. They were being socially and physically distant, and they were not congregating in crowds. And when do we, I'm, I'm panicked because we're running out of time, and I have a couple more things, but 
when do we get our flu shot? Do we get it in September? Do we get, do we wait until we're more at the beginning of, I don't know, what, when would you suggest we get it? Sooner than well, later? You know, my suggestion would be, and this isn't official, but this is me to you, yeah. <laughs> is I wouldn't necessarily get it now in September because there is evidence that in fact, the immunity might wear off when you get to February and early March, you may need another boost. I get my flu shot towards the middle and end of October because you generally don't see much flu until you get to the middle to end of November, beginning of December. Awesome. So the concern about waiting is that what happens if they run out of flu shots? That's really unlikely that we're going to run out of flu shots because every year there's a certain aliquot of flu shots that we just don't use. I would really be surprised if we ran out of flu shots. Okay, that's awesome. Now, should moms be doing something just to boost our kids' immune system? You know, do you need more vitamin C? Do they need more spinach? Is there anything we should be doing? Elderberry. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is, to the dismay of many, no. <laughs> so if a child is deficient, there are two vitamins among the many. Well, herbs, forget about. Jennifer, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about them. Just take them. If people Just want forget to use them, about them. Forget okay. about them. If, if people want to use them, fine. But it's, it's not something that you can recommend. But there are two vitamins that, that you should consider. For example, if you are deficient in vitamin D, mm -hmm. that does have an impact on your susceptibility to infection. So I would not mind recommending, and I do it myself, taking vitamin D supplements. The other vitamin that people take is vitamin C because it's a good antioxidant. So if people want to take a gram or two at the most of vitamin C, that would be fine. So vitamin C and vitamin D, okay. Any of the other concoctions and herbs, I would not do. Okay, throwing out the elderberry. Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> testing, can we just talk? testing um just really quickly there's so much confusion over testing what te what type of test should be we be looking to test when should we get tested do we need to sequester ourselves while we're finding out results things like that testing okay so if you do not need to be tested you don't necessarily and shouldn't get tested okay if you are in contact with someone who's been infected, or if you are in a situation where you suspect you might be infected, you want to get a test that specifically looks for the virus itself. Mm -hmm. It's called a PCR RNA test. You want to find out if you have the virus. If you are in a situation where they're doing screening, let's say you're about to make a movie and they say, we're not going to let anybody on the set until they've been tested. You can get what's called an antigen test, which screens everybody. It doesn't necessarily precisely tell you. It's not necessarily as sensitive as the PCR test. Tested. If you want to be in a situation where you want to make sure you're in a group that's going to be working together and you want to make mm -hmm. sure they're all negative, as opposed to, I really suspect that I'm infected. Mm -hmm. Then there's another test, which is an antibody test. It doesn't tell you whether you're infected. It tells you whether you have been infected. So if you're interested in determining if you've been exposed or infected, you can get an antibody test. The trouble with that is that they're not necessarily as accurate or predictive as some of the molecular tests that we use. So right now, if you don't have any reason to believe that you're infected, I wouldn't recommend that you get a test. Okay. All right. I'm going to let you go. Dr. Fauci, you must feel like you're on the longest film junket of your life, just answering the same things over and over. <laughs> oh my gosh. I can't, I can't thank you enough. Can I ask one more just for me? Sure. Of course. Okay. Just for me. When are we going to be able to sit in a theater and watch our favorite performers up on stage again? 
Well, that's something I really am craving and would like to do myself, so I'll give you the answer. I think it's going to be a combination of a vaccine that has been around for almost a year and good public health measures. I would think by the time we get to the end of 2021, maybe even the middle of 2021, I mean, if we get a vaccine, Jennifer, that's a knockout vaccine, that's 85, 90% effective. I don't think we'll get that. I'll settle for 70% effective. But if we get a really good vaccine and just about everybody gets vaccinated, you'll have a degree of immunity in the general community that I think you could walk into a theater without a mask and feel like it's comfortable that you're not going to be at risk. Oh, my gosh. That'll be the day. That'll be the day for all those performers out there and everyone who works behind the scenes for all those teachers, all those parents trying to get their kids. I'm, I'm just on behalf of all of them. I thank you so much. We're all working hard to stay optimistic. And I tell you your honesty and your, you're kind of parenting all of us through this. And um, we can't, you know, you, you just, you, you just couldn't have more crushes happening on you in the world for anything. Well, thank you. That's very nice of you to say that. I appreciate that. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to chat with you. It's been a real pleasure. Truly, anytime. Anytime <laughs> you want to chat, you just, you let me know. And I will just make that a priority. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate it. Take, Take care. care. Thank you so much. Bye, You're everyone. Welcome. Thank you.